for joining us. Um, so today we're holding a session under the premises of the Best Practice Forum on Gender and Digital Rights. Um, it's a forum within the IGF that aims to discuss uh, gender issues within the digital rights space. And this year's thematic, we're currently tapping on regulatory practices and where they stand at in terms of gender and digital rights. So are they really friend or foe to gender and digital rights? Um, I'm really glad to be here with a stellar panel of uh, speakers from across different sectors. And it's going to be a chill conversation on how we relate to regulation, especially internet regulation, as to how um, internet regulation really affects freedom of expression, privacy, um, and also the work of human rights defenders and journalists, among other cross-cutting issues. But before we go there, um, I want to uh, give the floor to Bruna. Yeah, or Daphne to present the BPF report for this year. Thank you. Thank you, Marwa. Hi, everyone, online and offline. Glad to see you here. So uh, this year at the BPF Gender and Digital Rights, um, as Mara mentioned, uh, we started studying um, how regulatory practices undermine gender diverse rights. And we came up with a report that then would analyze that based into three thematic areas. These thematic areas would be the first one, privacy and surveillance, also with a focus on reproductive privacy. The second area would be freedom of expression and gender disinformation. And the third area, freedom of association and religion. So throughout this year, uh, the BPF process was really to inform and discuss how these areas affect uh, gender and human rights. And we did the report based on case studies. So people, uh, the community would bring the case studies to us, we would analyze them, and they would then compile to the report. Um, the report is still open to, for review. It's also open for additional comments. So if you have interest, uh, come talk to us because it is still open until 20th of December. This is the date that we have to give it completely finalized to IGF. Um, yeah, and I hope that we have a nice really discussion here. Our panel, our panelists also work in different areas that we have touched upon in this report. So we are really glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Um, Bruna, would you like to add something? Hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, no, just on this this, this emphasis, um, for anyone that do, is not um, close with the BPF gender, this is part of the intersectional work of the IGF. So we have been going on ever since 2015. Yes, and worked in the most different topics surrounding gender discussions and so on. So um, we, ever since the beginning, we have addressed violence against women, we have addressed female empowerment, um, diversity and participation at the IGF, and, and there has been a lot of gender disinformation last year as well and, and a lot of topics. So we're very happy to have this session today and also for anyone that's interested in this work, if the BPF continues to exist, exist next year, we have an open mailing list, so if um, you want to join or would like to have some more information, just let us know and we can direct you to the website. So, thanks. Thank you. A request, please speak slowly. Sometimes the interpreters can't catch up. Okay, thank you, Amrita. Um, and I think just to echo what Bruna and Daphne said, uh, the work that we do at the BPF is really community driven. So we really welcome you all to submit your inputs to the reports or your comments. As they said, we haven't fin finalized it yet, and I think it should be finalized before the end of December, end of the year, um, as we try to look at how um, different communities are impacted by regulation across different regions of the world. 
and if any of the thematics is really um, relatable or resonating with your areas of work, please feel free to weigh in on the website or just shoot us an email. You can find the contact details on the website of the IGF. Um, so now I guess we can kick off uh, the session. And I would just like to start with some um, introductory remarks from the speakers as we try to debank what regulation really means for different sectors, stakeholders, um, but also for, for different people um, across, um, ac across uh, different layers of vulnerabilities and, and identities. I would start off with um, Anika. Um, Anika, I know you have a very succinct, ex extensive experience managing and pioneering in various national and international campaigns and policy change processes for women's rights, civil rights, media and digital transformation initiatives. And as we are here today in Ethiopia holding the Internet Governance Forum, um, I would really love that you just weigh in on the state of regulation across the African continent and how does it really relate to the work that you do, especially for different communities. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. I, I hope I'll live up to that expectation. Uh, again, the name is Oni Kamakwakwa. I'm uh, the head of Africa at the Global uh, Digital Inclusion Partnership. There's uh, a, some background noise I'm hearing from this side of the room, so perhaps someone who's listening to something else could uh, put some headphones so that it's not, it's the interpreter. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's like really <laughs> echoing. But okay, let's, let's move on. Um, so in, in the work that I've done, uh, you know, on this area, looking uh, more specifically at regulation, and uh, attempting to mainstream uh, the issues that predominantly and disparately affect women in particular. It's been uh, quite a journey, uh, honestly. And um, so, you know, especially looking at the landscape uh, of the African continent, uh, more specifically, we move from uh, areas and national uh, states where there is regulation, to states where there is none that even speaks to the different uh, experiences of our women, especially when we deal with uh, misgender, uh, when we deal with uh, gendered uh, disinformation in particular. I want to pick on that one, uh, especially. However, we've also found opportunities in that. You know, there's uh, been a lot around uh, the pushback uh, using defamation of character as a way to actually silence women uh, online who are speaking up on these issues. Uh, and I, I'm pleased to say that um, we've sort of taken, uh, with a lot of the feminist organizations that I work with, we've sort of taken the attitude of uh, looking at public interest litigation as a way to get us to what we need. Uh, and uh, the outcome of that has been uh, more recently in the Western Cape Court in South Africa, where uh, young girls took to social media to name and shame uh, abusers uh, online and were subsequently sued. Uh, we were able to take those cases up under an organization called Wise for Africa and uh, got a really great judgment that sets precedence where the judge actually says that this is these defamation lawsuits brought by uh, people who are accused of abusing women uh, through trying to silence them online is actually a form of silencing. It's not what uh, courts typically were expecting when they adopted, uh, when the laws of defamation were actually adopted. So that gives us a glimpse of hope that, um, you know, uh, going the route of public interest litigation could actually help us develop feminist jurisprudence that begins to push back on some of this uh, shrinkage of uh, women's voices, especially online. However, I have to say that it's extremely expensive 
uh, because these are usually high court cases where you need to hire an advocate and you know you are fighting both in court as well as the court of public opinion that is usually if, if the court of public opinion is already um, predominantly this uh, you know gendered misinformation you are not getting a lot of friends there anyway so uh, I think you know it's really important for us to really to push for implementation of regulations that exist because we have found that in pushing on feminist jurisprudence we are actually using laws that exist to protect women uh, and to defend uh, women against some of these un unlawful, uh, unfair uh, cases and what it means is that the, even though the laws might claim to be equal for all genders we really have not challenged them and demanded and required that they include uh, women, but also not just women, but people also with uh, different gender identities, that they are equally uh, protected uh, by these laws. And so for me, I think that's the one contribution I want to also make in the document uh, after this. I, um, I really apologize, I had not done that. But that's actually a very recent uh, case that came up uh, strictly where we, and where we were literally defending a Twitter account that had already been taken down by the platform, uh, but sets really great precedents as we move forward because I suspect that this using of the courts to silence women's voices online is something that we will start to see mushrooming in other jurisdictions as well, and that we need to uh, document this and be able to utilize um, the gains that we are getting in other areas. But uh, the regulations, we find that if, if and when they're there, they are not very well understood in terms of how they protect everyone and not just one particular group. I'll pause there for now. Fantastic. Thanks, Onika. And I think, um, yeah, what resonates with me is the glimpse of hope and how we need to mobilize the resources that we have. Perhaps now I'll go online with Mahima. Um, Mahima, who is the public uh, policy lead at uh, Bumble. Um, it's very nice to have someone from, um, yeah, from Bumble with us. And I know that um, your, your story is, is very personal as it started with a lot of trolls and, and, and online harassment. I would love if you can share more with us uh, before we uh, really get into uh, the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Mahima. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we can't hear you. You, you can't? No? Can you please unmute her? Hello? Well, dealing with a glitch that's very relatable. Can you try now? No, I think it's still muted. Yeah, it's still muted. Okay, um, sorry, Mahima, we'll come back to you. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll go to you, Mariana. So Mariana is a law professor at the University of St. Gallen, Switzerland, um, but she's also one of the founders of Internet Lab Brazil. Um, Mariana, I know that you have tackled a lot of feminist issues within the internet regulation sphere, and, um, sorry for that. Uh, so can you please address one of those really like big blocks of what sure. is currently happening at the confluence of the feminist movement and the internet regulation um, space, yeah. Sure, um, I think we'll have the chance to speak of specific cases later, right? Um, perhaps I just wanted to make a short introduction as to how I see thinking of regulation uh, in the gender and digital rights field based on this research experience uh, especially at Internet Lab with 
that's always been very collaborative with many talented researchers, some of, him, some of who are here. Um, so what I wanted to really focus on in these first minutes is that when we're addressing the legal field, um, we'll frequently focus on laws, on the process of approving them and what's stated in there. Uh, so, for example, what the framework is in each country and what kind of framework can women, LGBT people and other marginalized communities rely on. But regulation, of course, is a cycle, right? And any struggle that has the legal horizon in sight is not fulfilled, of course, once a law or regulation is approved. Because, of course, the regulation has to be enforced. Uh, and it can be very surprising how many elements can play a role in the success of this law or the intended results. I'm really happy to speak now after Onika when she has already mentioned public interest litigation, which I appreciate a lot. But I wanted to mention three of these elements just to start the conversation. So the first of them is that uh, when we have a regulation approved, we might, we might face unexpected interpretation of legal terms and concepts. So for example, if you use defamation laws to protect women from abuse, uh, from an abuse that has sexuality com uh, component, you might see judges using, for example, their morals to judge because the protected legal interest in defamation laws is usually the honor. And um, to tackle this, you really need to re understand the logic of the legal system. And I really think that interdisciplinary research is something that can highlight that. The second point that I'd like to highlight is um, legal procedural matters. And I think very little attention is given to these procedural matters, uh, which are they, they might really hinder access to justice. So for example, suppose a procedural law requires that the party itself, the victim or the target, uh, that they prosecuted instead of the state, that is a private procedure process, this might really hinder access to justice for poor women, for poor LGBT people, for example. And then the third thing relates to other law enforcement barriers. So we could mention many obstacles uh, faced in police and other law enforcement officers. Uh, but just to stay with one, we could mention software. Uh, so if the police software doesn't display a category encompassing that specific violence in legal and investigative terms, this can hinder, uh, this can hinder even starting an investigative process, right? So I think these issues and barriers must also be considered when we speak of how to regulate uh, and knowing how the judiciary works, uh, this makes us propose smarter regulations, so here we, here we go again, full circle. And uh, these are all things that must be highlighted in research, and that research must be connected then to the public debate and social movements, and that of course requires different methods as well. So for example, analyzing case law, doing field research and so forth, and be multidisciplinary. Uh, and I'm happy to speak of some results and some uh, understandings that uh, we reached at Internet Lab by looking at some of those laws in further interventions. Thank you. And very happy to be here. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Mariana, for these introductory remarks. I think they really set the tone as to how we need to view the, um, the legal system um, in order to really advance more feminist issues from, from within that system. Um, I hope now, Mahima, you can unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me in this panel. It's been really great to listen to uh, the views before me. Uh, so, so yeah, let me uh, give you a little background about myself and then I'll talk a little bit about the work the Bumble's doing and kind of the view of the internet as we see it. Uh, you know, I, like many women across the world, had the unfortunate experience of, you know, experiencing trolling, experiencing many different kinds of threats, whether it was on social media or via emails or, you know, in other forms. Uh, where it was probably different for me was that I was actually working in a tech company. So I had a very uh, interesting view into you know, the tools that are available on social media platforms, but also, you know, what's the legal infrastructure available to me? And then as somebody who's experiencing this very, you know, this, this harm, do I really want to go to court? And what are the reasons that I would maybe go to the police or not go to the police or find the case? And as we know, it's always really complicated. And it's never as simple as some harm has been done to me. And so I will therefore take 
you know, X option or Y option. Um, you know, the idea of having a safe space online for women has been really important in the, and to me personally, but also professionally. I used to work at Twitter and Twitter was of course a battleground for uh, activists and for journalists and for women in the public domain to actually stand there and make their voice heard. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me slow down. Uh, you know, there are some platforms that are really important for public uh, figures, uh, women public figures, to make their voice heard. And we have uh, captured, I think, in many different reports and many different organizations who have talked about, uh, you know, how these public figures actually are trolled and given threats and silenced. There is also uh, parallelly the case of everyday women who are in different areas of the internet, you know, trying to live their private lives on different websites, using different apps, and over there as well, they can be actually silenced or made to self-censor or just be scared and leave a platform because of the various, uh, you know, various things that are done to them. So, you know, part of what we're looking at around the world is that there are obviously governments around the world who say that they want to make the internet safer for women. Uh, in depending on which country you're in, uh, they are taking different approaches. In some countries, uh, uh, you know, clearly um, there is a re Australia, for example, has a regulator set up called the E Safety Commission, and it is specifically looking at holding industry to a standard, uh, you know, across different apps to say this is the minimum standard of safety that you must ensure that your platform has. And uh, Australia has passed a bill recently. And uh, they are also developing, you know, codes for industry to make sure that companies are able to provide that level of care. Uh, in other places, it may not be, you know, regulators may not be sort of, you know, doing exactly the same thing, but there are laws that exist which tactically try and address some of the harms that are taking place. So it could be video, it could be images, it could be different uh, activities, but where the work really lies, and I think some of you on the dice would be doing that is really seeing whether they are having the impact that they are supposed to, which is the safety of women or having um, an impact where it's actually top down surveillance and not actually serving the purpose that they are, say that they're meant to. So I think, um, you know, just as introductory remarks, we do need a lot more a evidence based approach to what is happening in the regulatory sphere across the world because a lot of governments and regulators say that they are looking to protect women and we must make sure that what they are trying to do is based in the evidence that these are the harms that exist today. B, while we dis discuss tactics, we must be aware that these things change a lot as technology changes. So the dominant harm that women are experiencing on the internet today may not be what is available um, tomorrow. And thirdly, there should be a, you know, a method or a mechanism to actually assess the impact of uh, regulations that are taken uh, or laws that are passed in uh, different geographies to make sure that they actually are having the desired effect. Uh, I know Japan passed a law um, about cyberbullying, which was very hotly contested because it crosses into speech issues. And they said that they will review it after a period of time to see whether it's actually helping cases of cyberbullying or silencing the larger internet. So there are different approaches being taken and um, yeah, and so that's where I'd like to do my introductory remarks. Thank you, Mahima. Um, thank you for these very um, extensive remarks. And I will definitely come back to you regarding uh, the bills that you mentioned. And I think it's very important to um, honor the issue of online gender-based violence within the 16 days of activism. Um, on uh, violence against women and girls across the world. Um, but since we're, uh, since we're mentioning or we're really talking about big tech and private sector, I'll stay here and um, revert back to you, Theo. Uh, Theo is the uh, Director of Bus Business and Human Rights at Ericsson. And um, I think it's a very unconventional actor that we have here today at the BPF on gender and digital rights. So uh, perhaps in your introductory remarks, you can tell us more about your work and where does Ericsson stand um, at the issue that we're tackling here today at the BPF? Thank you. Thank you. 
and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here tonight, uh, or today, I think it's not night yet. Um, but so in my introductory remarks, I thought we have uh, heard the other speakers talk about specific bills and uh, legislation that addresses uh, the issues that we are talking about today. But being one of the uh, representatives of the private sector and, and, and corporations, I thought I would just in the introductory remark take a step back and talk about the current trend of, of regulating corporate conduct and human rights in general, and specifically the trends that we are seeing on, on regulating uh, and requiring companies to, to implement uh, human rights due diligence measures. Um, so, and I'll come back to kind of how this is of course linked to the issues we're talking about today. Um, the trends are very much uh, currently being kind of pushed by the EU and, and the US. Uh, we've seen, of course, legislation on specific human rights topics such as child rights and, and forced labor. But now there is this overarching um, push to uh, implement or transform uh, international standards such as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights or the OECD guidelines into uh, legislation and, and actually enforce uh, human rights due diligence principles. Um, and as a starting point, I mean, we as a, as a company, we definitely support uh, this trend and it, sometimes it is viewed as going beyond the international standards, but it's important to remember that in the UN Guiding Principles themselves, recognize that in the state duty to protect human rights also is included regulation of, of corporate conduct. So this is a, a natural evolution and a natural step. Um, and uh, two issues that I think are important to the topic that we are discussing discussing now that we are trying to kind of push in the uh, discussion, for example, on the EU level with the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive is one, to ensure that uh, the scope of due diligence requirements uh, take a full value chain approach. There are some um, kind of interests within the EU that are pushing to limit this to only supply chain risks. And that would, of course, exclude all of the issues and risks that we are talking about today. Uh, and, and limit corporate responsibility only to, for example, labor rights issues in supply chains. Um, so that is important, especially from the perspective of a tech company, of course, to ensure that uh, our responsibility also uh, includes downstream due diligence and addresses how we develop technology, who we sell technology to, uh, how we are engaged in policy discussions on specific bills and, and regulation, uh, such as on defamation, privacy, surveillance, and so on. Uh, so that, I would say, is, is one of the key issues to, to really push through in the directive to make sure that, uh, that, that this is dealt with in, in the right way. Uh, the other issue, uh, building on the comment on uh, litigation, is the, are the provisions on, on civil liability in the directive. And that, of course, also ties back to the whole issue of value chain due diligence. If we exclude downstream due diligence, that means that civil liability provisions also exclude downstream uh, due diligence and issues of privacy and, and, and online harassment, for example. But if we make sure that uh, a full value chain approach is ensured in the, uh, in the directive, then hopefully that also gives new tools uh, to uh, both civil society uh, actors, but also, of course, uh, um, advocates and, and litigators to ensure corporate conduct through those civil liability provisions. Um, so, of course, this directive is, is, is more general, not just talking about these, these issues specifically, but we have always pushed for uh, using the international standards, such as the UN Guiding Principles, as a basis for the legislation. And why that's also important is that the UN Guiding Principles, of course, mention gender and women's rights specifically uh, as issues that corporations need to take into account in their due diligence. Um, so I think I'll maybe stop there and come back to some of the other work we're doing. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a very nice scene setting on the corporate conduct and how does it relate to gender and women's issues. And of course, we will get back to some of the um, yeah, issues you mentioned. Uh, now I'll go to you, Yulia. Um, Yulia is an international law and human rights expert. Um, she is currently uh, serving at the office of the OEC representative on freedom of the media. Um, I think um, maybe today, Yulia, you'll be more concerned about media regulation. And um, I know that the OEC has um, 
uh, established a joint declaration on gender justice and freedom of expression. Um, so maybe you can just uh, yeah, give us more insights into this. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> and thanks also for, for having me. And it's really been great to listening to the previous speakers and really also having this kind of like interdisciplinary approach. Um, if you allow for the introductory, I would rather go a little bit on this abstract level as, as previously, and then we can dive, I uh, can provide more information, a joint declaration um, later. Um, I think uh, also acknowledging that it's the 16 days campaign against uh, violence uh, against women that you mentioned, um, and we heard already from previous speakers about really targeted hatred to silence women or gender disinformation to discredit women or surveillance um, with the same uh, effect. Uh, I think it's also important and I think it's really great that in this panel we have the opportunity to address gender and digital rights a little bit more holistically than only looking at violence because while violence of course needs to be addressed no doubt and is one of the biggest kind of like obstacles um, when we look at women's um, participation in digital spaces or just in public spaces generally um, it's also important to look at various other things that are barriers and obstacles um, that women and others who are kind of like not representing the, the majority in society or have been marginalized um, in speaking out and in kind of exercising their human rights in the public and digital space. So I think we also ha will have to look at the design and deployment and development of, of technology about biases that are often introduced um, uh, or kind of like uh, brought into technology and then if they are kind of like uh, deployed in the digital setting, then we have not only a reproduction of these uh, asymmetric power structures we have in the offline world and we have seen and all these biases and challenges, but they're really being reinforced and amplified in the digital set setting, which then again kind of like impacts back into society. So I think it's really a great opportunity um, with the best practice forum, but also this panel to kind of like address all this from a more holistic approach. Um, and there are two more things I would like to say at this kind of like um, starting point, which is the first also linked a little bit to this holistic approach that I think is so crucially important, um, is that we see barriers and, 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 and obstacles, challenges really at every step. So at the question of like, women being able to speak out, participate, but also then the way they're targeted when they do so, which we have also seen this week in the very first session, which was on the feminist web, um, where there were really um, very mi misogynist and, and sexual graphic attacks on Zoom, for example, um, which means when we speak about specific things, we become, we as society, um, become um, um, targets. Um, but then also the impact it has later on. So I'm, I'm sure we will dive deeper into this as well in the, in the second round. But I want to mention it already now. Um, and that this really impacts, of course, the, the, the individual woman who wants to speak out or the marginalized person. But it really impacts society. It impacts our democratic governance, our possibilities to really um, create a peaceful and democratic kind of like common just um, community and, and world we want to live in. And the last point I want to say at this stage, because I'm representing an intergovernmental organization, um, that I think we need, of course, a, a whole of society approach. So I think it's important to have these different perspectives. But I want to speak a little bit about the positive obligation and human rights obligations of states. And this is something Theo already um, touched upon, and I'm grateful for that. Um, that we think, I think we really always have to consider and remember that states have a positive human rights obligation to protect, to fulfill, and to really realize our human rights online and offline. And we have plenty of human rights, including freedom of expression, media freedom, which are more the, the, the rights I am working on, but also specific women rights. And, and there's really an obligation. We have this kind of international um, rule set work already out there. Um, and then this means that it also needs to be ensured via regulation. So I think that, that kind of like linking back to the title of today's session, where the regulation is friend or foe, um, regulatory responses are important, of course. But all of us know, and I think we have heard plenty of examples throughout the week that unfortunately also legislation has of often been misused or been adopted under false pretexts or um, they are just taking place also in a specific context and setting. So the question is who is, who is the legislator, whose concerns are being addressed, um, who sits at the table. I mean, all these things, it's, it's never a silo. So I think this is important 
um, to consider. So the, the, the question of friend or foe is of course not easily um, to be responded, which of course is, is, is also the intention of this panel. But I think it is important to, to have regulation, um, but to ensure that it's properly, uh, properly done. Um, but I do think that we need transformative change and any social change builds on various aspects, including also regulation and legislatory approaches. So I think they are necessary, but we have to really be cautious that they are developed in a proper way. And then also throughout the entire regulatory cycle that we have heard before, um, um, also the implementation and enforcement, of course, is crucially important. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. I think you brought up some really cross-cutting considerations from representation to positive obligations, as well as going beyond this violence narrative uh, when it comes to addressing gender and um, digital rights um, in terms of regulations. And I think last but not least, we have uh, Bia, Bia, who, uh, Bia Barbosa, who's a journalist and a human rights specialist. She's also a civil society representative in the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Um, thank you for joining us today, Bia. And um, if you can give us your introductory remarks and uh, the state of activism, I guess, in Brazil or Latin America. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Mara. Thank you very much for the invitation and also for the amazing job that the BPF on gender and digital rights are doing and I congrats as well for the report that is ongoing. I've read it and I took some parts that I'm gonna comment in the second round here. So thank you very much for, for this space. I, I speak here as a, as a journalist that uh, who has closely followed the problem of uh, women journalists being attacked online for the last year. And, and if we look at the data of journalists killed uh, in the world, and especially in Latin America, for example, where 90% of the killed journalists are men, we may have uh, a wrong conclusion about violence related to journalists, because we may think that oh, if 90% of the journalists killed are men, there's no problems with women journalists. So it's the opposite, because the digital environment has been a, a, a very difficult um, place for women journalists to work and the, the initiatives and the, uh, the campaigns, uh, the violent campaigns against women journalists that have been developed online everywhere in the world are very, uh, have been very effective in silencing women journalists. For example, these years I worked also for a Reporter Without Borders office in Latin America. Uh, and during the elections in Brazil this year, we followed the accounts of 120 journalists in Brazil. And from August to October only, in this period, we uh, registered around 3 million offensive messages. Uh, and also posts that seek to discredit the work, the work of the, pr the, the, the press in general. And the report to be published in, in the RSF website showed that every week, four women occupied the list of the five most attacked journalists in Brazil. So um, uh, the most part of them in, on, in, on Twitter. So the volume of this aggression is frightening. Uh, they, they were campaigns coordinated by extreme right-wing groups, supporters of the current president of Brazil who lost the elections with highly misogynic characteristics and sexual connotations. When black journalists, black women journalists were targeted, of course, the messages were also racist. So, and the impact of this violence has been measured worldwide, not only in Brazil, but in Brazil, a research that we, we have conducted with gender in number, gender in numero organization, and Brazilian organizations as well, show that at least 15% of women in LGBT journalists who have experienced online aggression have developed mental health problems. So the impacts are very, not only it go beyond, uh, it goes beyond the, si the, the idea of silencing these women, but, it, but it's also, also we have developed mental health, uh, they have developed mental health problems. In this scenario, I think the response from digital platforms were, <laughs> were practically nil. Journalists are not recognized by this company, at least not from the standing point of their policies and terms of use as a group that needs to be 
protected so that the population's right to access to accurate information is guaranteed. And despite all the research and the evidence all over the world, social networks continue to be a permissive space for constant and organized violence against the press. And as we all know, this is not exclusive to journalists. Of course, we're talking here about women and LGBT and minority groups uh, and in an ongoing basis, it seems to me that uh, we have a regulatory <laughs> debate to be established uh, relating to violence against journalists as well. Um, because uh, as in other aspects, the companies have not responded to the challenge that we have been observed. I agree with the, point, the points brought by Mariana uh, related to, to different aspects of regulation and, and, and it's very positive that the feminist and the women movement has already advanced in this agenda, but from the journalist perspective, this topic is still quite a taboo uh, because there is, and it's quite distant from the community of journalists in general, uh, mainly because there is a natural and a justified resistance of journalists to, to regulations related to freedom of expression because in the most part of the time, they, uh, these regulations are used to silence journalists everywhere. But I believe that this case, uh, and the, the, the level of the violence that we have reached um, means that we cannot avoid, we can no longer avoid the debate um, because it's the absence of regulation or the, the social media and the platforms regulation that is now silenced women journalists. So I think that we have to move forward and, uh, uh, and tackle this debate, of course, uh, um, putting all the human rights uh, standards on the table, but I think that it can be no longer a taboo for us journalists. Thank you. Thank you, Bia. I think you really highlighted an important issue, which is um, the offline, online kind of dichotomy, where we see a lot of uh, incidents online escalating to killings offline. Um, and I think it's very important to, to bring this to the fore when it comes to the, regu the regulation debate. And perhaps just following up on this, I'll go back to Mahima. Um, and uh, yeah, can you please tell us more how Bumble is really trying to um, approach these issues and how can you make sure that the dating app is safe for women users and, and people from diverse genders and sexualities. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, happy to share some of what Bumble has been doing. So Bumble, as you know, is uh, it's a women first dating app. And the whole mission is to have like healthy and equitable relationships, which we know are challenge, uh, not just online, but offline as well. So it's a tall uh, mandate. Uh, you know, we have done some research and understanding what are the points uh, of challenge for women when they come online and when they spend time on an app like Bumble. So, for example, uh, you know, unwanted contact, which, you know, of course, we're talking about in the context of activists in, in much more violent context. But unwanted contact is an area of concern for a lot of women. And that's one of the reasons they don't like to be online. So by its very design that women make the first move, that is a point of friction in the entire experience of dating online where a woman is not inundated with messages. You know, she is more in control of who is able to message her because she has a little bit of control in terms of that first uh, contact that is made. Uh, similarly, unwanted images, you know, lewd pictures or, you know, pardon my French, but, uh, you know, dick pics that people, uh, you know, refer to, that is, uh, that is also a form of abuse that takes place online and it is really jarring and would keep uh, women, you know, offline or certainly off one platform or the other. So what Bumble did was uh, we used a proprietary technology to blur these images within the Bumble app uh, and, you know, users could choose whether they wanted to see the image because it is an app which has consensual uh, you know, conversations as well. So it could be an image that was sent through consent. We don't know that as Bumble, but it is blurred so that people don't have to view it and they can report it to Bumble directly. What Bumble has done in the recent past is actually open sourced this technology. So now others online, if they want to actually adopt this technology into their platforms, uh, you know, and their spaces, they can do that. Similarly, what Bumble did on the policy side was go and find out, uh, you know, markets and areas and countries 
in which some of these behaviors were crimes offline, but were not captured online uh, and have actually, uh, you know, worked in six states in the US and also in the UK when the uh, online safety bill was being discussed to actually highlight uh, that cyber flashing is something that needs to be captured within the law so that when women go to the police to say this happened to me, they are not told, you know, we know it's wrong, but it's not illegal. So, uh, and just a last, um, you know, so there are, uh, you know, we're, we're making efforts to make the internet ecosystem, not just on Bumble, but outside Bumble, safer for women, because we believe that then it would become safer for everyone. And just to point to the mental health, you know, the aspect that you mentioned, when someone is the victim of uh, online abuse and certainly sexual uh, assault or violence, uh, we know that, you know, one, one thing online is always taking the account of the post off. And that uh, seems like a victory. But we also at Bumble are aware that there could be, um, uh, you know, a need for talking to a counselor or a therapist. And so Bumble is actually partnered with the organization to, uh, uh, to uh, called uh, Cheyenne, which is a French NGO. And the program that we offer is Bloom. And so our users can actually access either self-guided courses or speak to a therapist via uh, chat or in-person sessions. Uh, you know, if they have been the victim of uh, such an incident online or even offline, if they met somebody uh, through our app. So we're trying to take a holistic approach to see how we can make Bumble safer, certainly, but also can the effects benefit the rest of the online ecosystem. Thank you so much, Mahima, for this. And um, perhaps also just following up on the mental health issue, I'll go to you, Onika. And I know you're really showing a strong sensitivity to a lot of issues that are, and dynamics that are affecting women and other disadvantages populations. Um, today, how, to what extent you see um, the issue around mental health and trauma-informed spaces is really um, echoing within the regulatory space, especially in Africa where there's a lot of conflicts and, 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 and people need uh, counseling and support and when it comes to um, to trauma and violent images and um, yeah images of rape and and really um, uh, shocking uh, graphics online uh, great question I think um, you know we can almost thank the COVID experience for at least highlighting some of these issues, uh, especially in sectors where they have predominantly been uh, ignored. However, one of the things that I'm seeing is that we are now finally open to having these discussions and even updating some of the policies and laws. So for example, South Africa has one of, um, I think what we've been talking about is one of the, the latest and most up-to-date uh, cyber uh, criminal uh, bills uh, that we have uh, so far in the, in the region. Yet, uh, we are still faced with a challenge of, you know, having a bill that's considered to be progressive on these issues, but a law enforcement uh, regime that's uh, not knowledgeable and educated about how to enforce uh, these laws that exist. So I think, uh, you know, so we sort of have this gap of policy and implementation, which is something I think that plagues this region a lot. Uh, we are really good at adopting conventions and treaties at international level. We are also great at updating our national laws, but implementation just uh, doesn't seem to to happen uh, as fast. And I think that we have an opportunity to recognize that there is a capacity deficit that exists uh, with the current uh, enforcement agencies that we have right now and the laws that we are, we've either adopted or are seeking for them to adopt. So we have to uh, make sure that we, we do this capacity we, uh, development for, for these agencies so that they understand uh, these issues. The other thing that I think that gets us uh, into a bit of a conundrum, especially in the region, is the issue of language. Because sometimes the language in itself is violent. Uh, and it takes a while for us to recognize that because that we are here speaking English is actually not a natural thing even for me, right? So sometimes, um, you know, and we see this, uh, I think the platforms have a lot of this experience when it comes to moderating 
uh, speech online because uh, you know our biggest complaints now has been that it's not localized this moderation of speech so when I report something and I'll just give you an example and I, I apologize that it's really graphic where um, the gentleman well I don't know we can call him a gentleman but anyway this particular male person uh, posted online um, on one social media platform that um, the vagina of a young girl is nice however society has a problem with it but what they did is that they posted it in their vernacular language so for english moderators this is meaningless right and even when we attempted to translate it for them and report it and consistently say this is violent right it's statutory it's, it, it just rings all the bells we still got this classic standard re response of this does not violate our community standards. So the question uh, comes, who sets these community standards? Who is the community? If uh, we are sitting here in this region and our speech moderators are sitting in another continent and may or may not understand our language, uh, and yes, there is the automatic translation uh, online, but the context requires some level of nuance as well uh, that goes beyond just simple translation. So I, I, I'll leave it at that to say that we, we, we have finally recognized the issues. I think we are all quite conversant on what's bad about what's happening right now and what we need to adopt in terms of how to fix it. But implementation is still just really hitting us badly. Thank you, Onika, and I think um um, yeah, this just sounds music to my ear, whose community standards are these. Um, and perhaps this is also a note to my BPF team to add this to the report. Um, so I'll just swing back to you, Bia. I know you have time constraints. Um, and I know you also had comments on the report, um, which you're welcome to present to us. Thank you. Thank you. No, I just, yeah, I would just like to, to uh, take advantage of one case that you mentioned in the report to, um, to, uh, to stress that um, we really need to be careful about regulation, even if I support <laughs> platforms regulation regarding violence, gender-based violence and, and violence against uh, journalists. Be, and I would like to share an example of what, what happened last year in Brazil related to that, and it's one of the cases that you mentioned in your report. In 2021, um, President Jair Bolsonaro uh, issued a provisional, uh, provisional executive order that intended to forbid the practice of content moderation, except in, in justified cases, under the, the pretense of allowing ample freedom of expression, communication, uh, and thought in Brazil. Although the, the provisional measure um, established ex exemptions um, by denying, as a general rule, the prohibition of content removal with sanctions of no compliance, the regulation created an online, uh, would create an online environment prone to the circulation of harmful speech, particularly distorts, distorted speech of political gender violence, hate speech, and misinformation targeting women and LGBT people. Among the exceptions of the test, the, the text, content authorized to be excluded or blocked by the platforms uh, would be content that uh, in, would, uh, relate, would be related to incitement of acts of threat of violence, including reasons for discrimination or prejudice of race, color, sex, ethnicity, religion, and sexual orientation. There was no mention of gender-based violence among the listed bypass possibilities, would open, what would open a gap for the maintenance of this type of discourse uh, on social networks and deny it. Uh, since the beginning, the existence of such forms of discriminations. The president of the Senate summarily rejected the executive order, but there are still some bills in the Brazilian parliament that propose this type of limitation to the operation of the social networks. Um, 
I also would like to uh, reinforce, I think that Julie would be able to uh, go further the joint declaration, but I just would like to, 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 to comment two uh, recommendations of the joint declaration of freedom of expression and, and gender justice. One of them says that uh, we, in consultation with media organizations and representatives of women journalists, states should develop and implement integrated prevention, protection, monitoring and response and response mechanisms to ensure the, safe, the safety of women journalists. And here we have a big problem because many journalist protection policies in different parts of the world are not developed with a gender perspective and are, they totally ignore digital security protection measures. Uh, when you look to the, the, at least at the Latin America mechan uh, protection mechanisms um, for journalists, uh, they, at the beginning, they were able to uh, look for threats on, on social networks, but they don't have a specific digital measures to, uh, uh, to protect journalists after that. And another recommendation is that, the, of course, the internet intermediaries should be particularly mindful on the way that their services automated or algorithmic process in business practice to increase user engagement, target advertising, or engaging in profile mainly amplified gender stereotypes, bias and misogyny and gender-based violence. Um, and, and that the company should ensure that their content moderation and, and creation policy and practice do not discriminate on the basis of gender and other protective attributes. Uh, we are very, very, very far from this reality. I believe that as activists, we should take advantage of a broad debate that uh, is uh, going on about platform regulation in dif different parts of the world to address this issue, especially violence against women journalists. Um, UNESCO, for example, should launch in February a global uh, framework for regulation of platforms. It will also be a document of recommendations. Uh, and we have already many recommendation documents everywhere. So it's not a, a problem that not knowing what to do, the recommendations are there. But I think that is a multilateral tool that can be used in advocacy strategies in different countries to ensure the adoption of a more protective legislation. The idea, for example, of risk assessment, which is already presenting in the Digital Service uh, Act in Europe, is a topic that could be interesting for a more protective approach for journalists. I believe that UNESCO framework could go on this direction. The, the document is still open to contribution, so I think that we could uh, take advantage of this space to, to, uh, to reinforce the recommendations that the Joint Declaration brought us. And finally, I would like to share with you an initiative that we are developing the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, uh, which I, we also hope can contribute to adoption of policies and regulations that promote diversity in the digital environment and in the ICT sector. It's called the Gender and Diversity Agenda, a project that has been implemented since 2021 by the, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGI, uh, and the agenda has 10 challenges and more than 240 proposals of actions uh, to implement this challenge, to face this challenge. It, it, as the, our committee, as CGI, the agenda is a multi-stakeholder document. Uh, he's not published yet. He's, he's been building by consultations inside Brazil and uh, outside as well. We organized it here at the IGF and a workshop yesterday sharing this experience. So I invite you also to, to know this um, this initiative that we hope that can foster more, a more protective regulation, but also a regulation that is based on human rights standards. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really sorry that I, would need, I need to leave early. I'll stay with you five more minutes, but I have a, a panel that starts at three. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bia. And I think saying within the Brazilian space, I would go back to you, Mariano. And I know that you worked a lot on um, bodily issues, and I know that regulation is not really in good terms with women's bodies. And um, yeah, I mean, I know you would have to address these issues. Um, perhaps you have slides to present, yes, right? Yes, please. So if you can screen them, them, technical team, thank you very much. So thank you. It's really, really interesting to hear you all. And I appreciate many of the remarks that have been made 
Um, so Julia's remarks on how regulation is one of the strategies for addressing states' positive obligations. And also, I think Bia, who has been a very important promoter of gender digital rights in Brazil, she already spoke a little bit of regulations gone wrong, let's say. Um, but I wanted to speak of this like general framework of the laws that have been approved in Brazil in the past 10 years to address especially gender-based violence um, and different aspects of gender-based violence. And just as an introduction, I think there are two things that are important to say. The first is that, of course, legislation, regulations, they have different roles. And we know, feminists know very well that uh, one of them is symbolic. So, for example, when the Supreme Court decided in 2018 uh, that um, LGBT um, that speech against LGBT, hate speech against LGBT was encompassed in the anti-discrimination law in Brazil that becomes really like a narrative also uh, strategy, right? It, it, it becomes part of the strategy of the movement to say, look, this is illegal, this is something that's not allowed. So we know that symbols are important, but I'm gonna address more like the effects, uh, the proper effects uh, of the laws here. And the second thing, which I think is also a general comment, is that there's a lot of discussion in Brazil and a lot of criticism on the role of criminalization uh, for our movements, especially because as we're in a very unequal country, we know that criminal law um, affects different groups differently, and especially black people are disproportionately affected, affected by the criminal system. So this is something that I think is also like a general uh, uh, approach to the issue because that's a backfire in itself, right? When we approved uh, laws that criminalize, that's always something that has to be taken into consideration as well. And that said, I really just wanted to show this quick framework uh, that I've been working on, and that's, I don't think it encompasses everything, but that's mo I think it's, they are the most important laws that have been approved in the past 10 years to address gender-based violence. Um, and I wanted to focus on two of them, which I think we can uh, refer to as having had uh, backfire, let's say. Let me see if I can move. I don't think so. Can you move to the next one, please? Yeah, good. Uh, so the first one is one that was called Carolina Dickman Law. And uh, it's interesting that many of these laws, they have names of women because they really followed controversial cases, cases that were very mediatized. Uh, and this law was approved in 2012 after this woman who is an actress, she had her pictures disseminated online. Uh, and that case became very well known. It was one of the first very well known cases of intimate images being disseminated. Uh, and it generated a lot of public discussion and right after it happened, this law was approved. Uh, the law uh, criminalizes hacking into another, another person's computing device. Uh, and uh, if you can take it to the next one, please. Pass the slide. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to show is that uh, although this law was approved to address, supposedly to address this case, and it even carries the name of Carolina, it doesn't really address her, her story because her device wasn't really hacked. That's not really what happened. What happened in her story was that her email was invaded, and this law doesn't, even, doesn't really address uh, that specific situation. So there was a big narrative in the media of how uh, now there, was, uh, there were laws in place to protect situations like Carolina's, and it wasn't really so. And as you can see, one of the paragraphs of this law establishes that the penalty is increased by one third to one half if the crimes committed against the President of the Republic, the President of the, of the Federal Supreme Court, and so forth, uh, showing that perhaps uh, protecting women wasn't exactly uh, the reason why this law was approved in the first place, right? So sometimes there's a lot of narrative about something being protective of women's rights online. When you really look into it, that's not really the case. And then, yeah. And then I'd like to address another one that was approved more recently, and that's the stalking law. And this was also considered 
somewhat of a victory for a feminist movement that had been speaking of how these actions of stalking, of persecuting someone repeatedly, they really didn't find an expression in the legal uh, framework because we're often speaking of uh, very, let's say, small actions that per se are not illegal, right? So for example, sending someone a message is not illegal. Uh, adding someone through another profile is not illegal. But when you look at them uh, systematically, you see that there's a situation there that's causing a lot of distress, right? So this law was finally approved to address this, but digital rights activists at the time were already um, we're already trying to address that maybe uh, the definition here was a bit too broad and it could be used to um, it could be used against activists and that's precisely what happened so perhaps uh, you've heard of sleeping giants sleeping giants is an organization that uh, uh, it's not really an organization so it's different groups in different countries but uh, it's a strategy let's say that has been used against uh, certain uh, profiles, certain people, certain companies uh, to make it uh, very visible when they're, uh, for example, acting against democracy or against human rights. And Sleeping Giants, what it does is to make campaigns against certain actors. Uh, and what happened in this specific case that I wanted to show you, and sorry that it's also uh, very bad language, uh, this TV presenter, uh, he said live on TV, uh, that gays were a disgraced race. And then uh, Sleeping Giants started to campaign against this person, uh, asking basically um, uh, funders, um, um, what's the name of the advertisers? Advertisers to stop advertising for the program. And Siqueira Jr., this TV presented, he sued them for stalking because what he said was that uh, he was being persecuted repeatedly by them, by this campaign online, and that that was harming his in psychological integrity and invading or disturbing his freedom or privacy. And he actually got an injunction against sleeping giants, um, which obliged them to stop this campaign. So uh, this is just another example of how we have to really carefully craft uh, these laws when we're thinking of protecting, of course, the, the, the intention was clearly really good, uh, but how do you clearly craft it out so that it doesn't really um, backlash, right? Uh, there would be many different things for me to address in these different uh, laws as well, but I think for the sake of time, I will stop here, and then perhaps in the discussion I can address other situations in which, in which uh, these regulations have gone wrong as well. Thank, Thank you. you, Mariana. I think it's very essential to have a, a, a bigger picture of what's going on, and it's good to have you here um, yeah, portraying the Brazilian landscape. I know we've been diving a lot on gender and um, women's rights issues, and I would like to go back to the corporate conduct. I know that you, Theo, spoke about the downstream due diligence. Uh, perhaps because we have, you know, an interdisciplinary audience, if you can tell us more about what does that mean and how we can really conduct um, due diligence against a backdrop of a fragmented regulatory framework that overlooks these issues that we've been speaking on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so to start, maybe it could be helpful to uh, explain a little bit more about Ericsson as a company. Uh, so we are what is usually called a network vendor. Uh, so we are not an operator, internet service provider or platform. So we are not facing those types of issues of, for example, government, uh, government requests and so on. But what we do is develop the technology, design and develop the, the solutions, the, the technology that, it, the, that then enables operators, platforms, and so on. Um, so one example of, I mean, of course, we have ongoing kind of downstream due diligence in our sales process where we always evaluate 
what type of technology we are selling, in what context, to what customer, how can it be misused, and can we build in certain safeguards from a technical perspective, but also contractually with, with the customer, for example, limiting the, the, the use of the technology. Uh, but some examples additionally of, of how we kind of proactively address these issues uh, and, and that tie into the, the topic of, of women's rights specifically on tech is that we last year published a, a human rights assessment of 5G technology. Uh, so as a, a, a network vendor, we of course are kind of the key player in developing and enabling 5G technology being then the new generation of, of mobile networks. And we wanted to, at the early stage, address potential issues of misuse or how kind of uh, already known risks for human rights and, and women's rights uh, can be uh, materialized in different or new ways with 5G technology or also potentially exacerbated. And I'll just give you a few examples. The full report is available on our, our website, so you're more than welcome to, to read the full report. Uh, but some examples that we uh, looked into are, for example, uh, the uh, increased use of IoT devices. Um, so already with issues of, for example, domestic surveillance, uh, with increased use of IoT devices, that potentially open up for uh, other types of, of, of surveillance or surveillance through new products, of course, increase that risk in, in for already marginalized and at-risk groups. And an additional issue with IoT devices is that the uh, third parties that create these IoT devices not always have the same kind of strong encryption of, for example, other handheld devices or are not as used to dealing with issues of privacy and freedom of expression. So there, there is an important role of, of course, raising awareness with those third parties on how to design those products uh, with that in mind. Uh, another issue that is definitely not new to this space is network shutdowns. But again, with from the perspective of 5G technology, with more dense deployment of cell towers or cells, that also potentially enables more precise network shutdowns. So while today maybe you need to shut down an entire region or a, or a block in a city, this will potentially be able to then target specific, um, even a building or, or, or a specific person, for example. Uh, and then the third one is, is network segmentation. So again, I mean, kind of the legitimate use of, of that is, of course, to optimize how the network uh, functions and to make sure that uh, the, the uh, kind of focus of the network is, is uh, diverged into uh, prioritized areas and so on, such as, for example, healthcare. Uh, but again, misuse that could lead to, for example, uh, throttling or uh, more, uh, again, precise uh, limitations of who has accessibility to the network and services such as digital healthcare, uh, uh, education, and, and so on. Um, so these are some of the, just the, some of the few issues that we uh, addressed in the report. Uh, you're, uh, of course, more than... I'm not very comfortable with them. No. The Sorry. volume is missing. Oh. Can we please mute, mute the Zoom? <laughs> Uh, just to wrap up, then I'll say that, I mean, we've talked about legislation, but what's also important in our industry, particularly to address these issues, is through standardization. Uh, because that's at the early stage of where we agree on how products are developed, what kind of safeguards need to okay. be in place. Uh, so that's an additional way that we are working to address these issues is in standardization bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Um, I think it gives a very nice picture of how uh, corporate conducts uh, different risks assessments in order to make sure that they address a lot of uh, human rights issues. And I guess speaking of internet shutdowns and, and free speech, I'll go back to you, Yulia. And um, I guess you would want to tackle the, the declaration, but it's, it would also be nice if you can also um, talk us through how you see media regulation against you know, the background of crackdown on journalists and uh, shrinking of civic spaces. And how can we make sure that, yes, regulation, it is necessary, but at the same time, we do not create a chilling effect on freedom of expression. Thank you. Thanks so much for this really pertinent um, question. And there, I think we don't have enough time to speak about all the 
really excellent points that we already heard in, in the course of the last hour. Um, I wanted to start with following up on something that Bia uh, said before, um, that's really this kind of like limiting, and also links a little bit to your question, limiting speech to protect speech, right? So I think this is really what we need to um, acknowledge, that the notion of we need all, um, like limit less freedom of expression means that there is a de facto limitation of speech of some, right? Through violence, through business practices, through all these different things we have been discussing. So regulation really needs to take on this role of ensuring that free speech for everyone is available, right? And that participatory um, and inclusive freedom of expression is possible. So I just wanted to kind of start with this. <clears throat> with this point, um, but also kind of like recognizing that all the things that we've been discussing throughout the week really have this gendered perspective. Um, and one of the points is this really kind of like lack of rule of law also in a digital um, context. So I want to maybe say two more things before I go into the joint declaration. Thanks for, for mentioning it. And, and then also going to your um, question about media regulation is, um, really trying to consider the entire kind of like um, lifeline of a speech. When we now take the example of freedom of expression, um, I, I mentioned already before that we have to recognize kind of like every step. So it's really about access to technology, access to means of expression, um, digital divides. It's the question of um, um, literacy and, and access to education and all these kind of points, even before we can look at who is even able to participate in kind of like the public sphere and, and, and freedom of expression. Then we have speaking out, and here again we have a very clear link to what Bia said before about um, speaking out publicly, for example, because you are a woman journalist or because you are a woman politician, which is also something that was addressed already at this um, IGF puts the person at an additional kind of like risk of being targeted and being silenced. Um, and then we also see that there are specific restrictions of gendered expression. Um, and, and for example, the um, reproductive health issue that was mentioned before. Um, and then we also see that all the kind of already problems and challenges that we see are amplified in a digital context where we have platforms that are really kind of um, um, prioritizing user engagement in view of advertising revenues, um, even if it's at odds with public good, with diversity, um, with accuracy, um, which brings along so many um, additional kind of like challenges. Um, but I think I'm now trying to move away from the challenges because I think we have established many of them, but kind of like, what can we do? Um, so indeed, the uh, um, OEC representative on freedom uh, of the media together with the other free speech mandate holders have this year issued a joint declaration that kind of for the first time really touches upon this um, horizontal issue of gender and gender justice in freedom of expression. And it puts forward several recommendations for different stakeholders, including also media outlets, but also platforms when we speak about due diligence and many of the things that Theo touched upon, but also really looking at states and what needs to be done to remove the structural and systemic inequalities and barriers that we see and discrimination that we see also um, reinforced in the, in the digital context. Um, two points in this context that we heard before when, when Mariana, you mentioned also that judges um, judge on morals and kind of like, so it's also a question who are enforcing, who are sitting at kind of like the decision-making power again in different steps. But it's also that very often public morals that are also understood from a very um, a patriarchal uh, value system, um, it's very often used as an excuse to protect, or it's this kind of like paternalistic approach to protect women online by in fact restricting um, their expression and possibility to speak out online. Um, and this links back to this, this kind of like freedom on, always has to be inclusive because otherwise it's, it's a privilege of some, which means it's not freedom and it's not a uh, right for everybody. Um, I also brought a few joint declarations in case you want to um, um, grab it. It's, of course, also online. But in the sake of time, just two more small things, because I think it's really important also to touch upon the safety of women journalists online, um, which also links to the question about media regulation specifically, um, where we have, like the OEC has worked on it for, uh, for quite a while. I also brought um, a, a resource guide, because I think we what we tried is also moving away from these recommendations. We heard that there are plenty of recommendations and documents out there of 
what should be done, but really trying to look at how should it be done, right? How was it already um, successful in a specific context? What are the good practice examples that we can learn from? And, and seeing what the different stakeholders, be it the legislative, be it the executive branch, be it the judiciary, but also the law enforcement, which very often is kind of like this first step of institutionalized impunity when we speak about online violence and attacks and restrictions. So there are all these different actors and, and, and we really need this kind of like whole of society approach, but recognizing that the safety of journalists as, as one of the examples is a broad concept, right? So safety does not only mean not to be killed, as was pointed out by, by Pia, but, uh, Pia, but also um, um, psychological health, also um, legal um, safety and all these different aspects. So it's really also about safety protocols and all these other things. Um, in this context, it's relevant also to mention the monitoring, I think, of online attacks, because if we look at the cases of where really violence against women journalists escalated into um, horrific online attacks or offline violence or even assassinations of women journalists, you can really look at the history of attacks online beforehand. So I think it's really crucially important, and this is something that we are working on now together with, with Julie Possetti from ICFJ, and to really try to identify indicators for escalation so that we can move from this denouncing when something happened to really a preventive approach and saying online violence is, is first of all a kind of indication for potential offline violence later and worst case scenario impunity or impunity for killings. But we also need to take those and learn from what has happened and when something went wrong to see how can we prevent it in the future. And the second point is um, platform governance. I mean, we spoke, it was touched upon a little bit by, by Theo, but online, in the online context, um, many, I mean, most of the power and gatekeeping to information and gatekeeping to information spaces is really held by a handful of corporations, of companies, um, that are all based also in Silicon Valley. So there are many other issues to that as well that we have discussed during the week. But, but there is also a lack of transparency, accountability and inclusiveness in the process that are being developed. And here I just want to point out um, one point that if gender and human rights is not considered from the very beginning, really from the question of designing and developing technologies and setting the rules for the spaces where people can speak out. It's very difficult to, to bring it in later and you will have all these gendered um, impacts and effects. So human rights due diligence is crucially important and it of course has to include this gender perspective but then also be clearly linked to mitigation measures that again have this gender perspective in there. And here's really where regulation plays in and where states have to make sure that this framework, this for online speech is, is set, but not focusing on content. I think this was also made clear before, but really focusing on the processes. So focusing on the reach of speech and not the speech itself. Um, so I, I already see the, the pointing to the hand, so I will close with that. But uh, we also work on, on this platform governance and I brought also a few publications from this. Um, and I think I will stop there. I'm sorry, I forgot. Yes. Thank you, Julia. And I think um, what you brought up is a very excellent summary that would pave us the way to closing remarks <laughs> as we are trying to wrap up the session. And I think, as with the title of this session, which is our regulatory practices really friend or foe to gender and digital rights, I would really be interested to hear from you. Um, what you think about in 30 seconds? Sorry, but we don't have time. Uh, so I'll go with Mahima first. Um, sure, to be very brief, I, I'm based in India and this country can be very patriarchal in its view towards women and the right that women have to be online. So I do believe that we need to, uh, you know, we need to protect women on the internet and not from the internet, which is sometimes uh, the view that a very paternal uh, government can take. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mahima. Um, Onika? I think um, I will just briefly say that it's important as we continue to do this work to consistently recognize that uh, online violence has, has offline impact and vice versa. 
And so it's really important that we continue to not see online violence in isolation to what actually happens to gender inequality in our society in general. Thank you. Theo? Thank you. So I'll just reiterate the point of making sure that any kind of future due diligence legislation really captures these issues. And then the other point is, of course, that any due diligence efforts include the uh, uh, affected and impacted stakeholders uh, in, in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Mariana? I think my answer is a fringe if gender lenses are considered and if there's a good understanding of the general context, social and legal, so then definitely a friend, but it can be an enemy too. Thank you. Uh, Julia? Maybe building on this, um, yes, and it needs to be built on collaborative approaches so that it's really a preventive protective, but also in the end, kind of an empowering tool of regulation. And one additional sentence, if I may, that I wanted to say before is that, that women's rights are always an early warning sign. So I think we really also have to link it to the general um, uh, authoritarian trends we see across the globe and the backsliding of human rights. So this is an additional aspect where we need to fight for women's rights in digital spaces, linked also to the broader discussion on human rights and democracy. Yeah, so collaborative approaches, dismantling um, institutionalized impunity, taking a full value chain approach and protecting women on the Internet and not from the Internet. Um, I think all those are really words that echo and have echo during the session. Um, so now we're going to take a few questions from the floor or from the um, online um, uh, chat, if there are any before wrapping up the session. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this um, panel and for platforming this conversation. My question is more for Mahima. Um, you spoke about um, the UK and the US, but I'm wondering um, what are your interactions with regulatory frameworks that are perhaps hostile to products like Bumble, like I'm thinking of Pakistan or other countries perhaps in Asia or um, in the, in the non-West? Um, and secondly, how are you approaching protecting queer communities in, again, like countries or contexts where same-sex um, relationships might either be heavily discriminated against or even illegal? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll take one more question. Yeah, Diana, go ahead. Um, hello, thank you very much for this uh, great panel. Um, I am from Jordan and uh, the um, culture of honor is very present in the everyday life. Um, even if it doesn't uh, kill you, you live in the uh, fear that uh, it will at least harm you greatly. And uh, there seems to be a lot of encouragement for us to speak up online. Um, which is really good. And I see increased funding for lawyers for some high profile cases, which is also good. But I was thinking, what can online communities uh, do uh, for the time that women are waiting for a result for their trials, as well as their lives afterwards? Because those two phases seems to be gaps in the programs addressed. Um, and also there is, it's probably the higher risk uh, for them because this is when they face the backlash. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, so I guess I'll go to Mahima for the first question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, you know, we are starting uh, to engage with other uh, countries. So we haven't engaged with all the countries out there, but certainly depending on where uh, we find the conversation, I give the example of Australia because we have actually been involved with formal processes regarding how, you know, the sector is going to be regulated. So it's quite like, it's quite drilled down in terms of uh, the detailing. In India, for example, you will find a lot of laws that have been passed which capture some of the, uh, you know, the tactics used against women online. But we are, we've already hosted a number of conversations that we hope to lead into, uh, you know, more formal reports and things which actually talk about whether the development of tech policy and then, you know, what is coming out actually has, uh, you know, a gendered view, at, uh, you know, the, uh, in mind and if we actually measure the impact on gender and there's some researchers frankly who've done really good work in India uh, you may I mean, I'm sure some of the panelists are familiar with their work uh, you know with drawing on their papers we're drawing on 
their observations and we're having these like inter uh, multi stakeholder discussions with uh, great participation from uh, some of the uh, think tanks and NGOs uh, in India. As for um, you know, make sure, making sure that we cater to all communities. In fact, uh, as you know, Bumble was started more with that binary in mind. Our user base has obviously grown, so we actually work with Glad in the US to make sure that our users can self-identify, and then that translated into having to kind of look at how the matching is done because women make the first move. So you know, in same-sex matches, anyone can make the first move. And similarly, when it comes to protecting, um, you know, different communities, we're like we're working with groups to understand what. Uh, further protections we can offer. I can give an example of women in India because we've done some work here, which is that they wanted actually their initials uh, in their profiles and not their full name till they wanted to share it because uh, people were scared of, um, you know, their matches maybe finding them in other places on the internet. So that was the protection that we gave in India first, and then we'll roll it out in other places if people uh, need that. So in a waiting work in progress, but I can share that much. Thanks. Thank you, Mahima. Um, we'll take another question. Final question. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Alan Kusuma from Indonesia. Uh, my organization has been focusing on online gender-based violence for quite a few years, and we found a challenge that is uh, very much has already been uh, told here. I just want to raise an, uh, a really issue, uh, a really an issue uh, that we face when we are trying to get the online gender-based violence reported to the law enforcement and the, uh, the, 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 the issue is there is a lack of digital evidence that we can get from the digital platforms and there is also an issue of the law enforcement trying to get the victim to surrender their gadget which also pose uh, a, a privacy issue so maybe is there any best practices uh, from the digital platforms on having an evidence-based uh, situation or ev ev evidence-based um, uh, mechanism that can be easily accessed by the victim so they can provide evidence to the police and how maybe from the technical um, aspect like the design of the gadget when um, how can we get through the digital forensic without having have to surrender our own privacy when we are giving the police our phone um, for example maybe if there is any uh, comment on that thank you thank you so much um, so who'd like to take uh, Diana's question um, yeah. okay. I can perhaps start. Um, I think we've been seeing a lot of cases of trials involving violence against women and domestic violence that got really mediatized around the world, right? And I think the one thing that I think is important to say, you were referring to online communities and what could be done in between. I think it's really important that uh, online communities, feminist movements, they provide support uh to the women who are going through this online especially because we've seen from very mediatized cases especially from the us and europe uh that uh campaigns and public opinion starts to shift to a very like sexist view and uh, we've seen some cases also from the global south of trials that got very mediatized and um in which the support the feminist movement support for the woman who was like under uh who was on the trial uh, was really important, be it for the public opinion, be it just for uh, support. Of course, one can say that also the cases end up being influenced by this public opinion. That's a harder one to make. Uh, but anyway, I think it's really important that um, these, um, these discourses get mobilized, right? Um, and then just to quickly address the part of evidence, I don't think I can answer to all of that, but for sure, uh, the judiciary should have guidelines for access to evidence and for keeping evidence safe. And that's a problem that we've been seeing in many countries that um, sometimes people won't want to report something because uh, they know that they're not really secure practices and perhaps something that they just want to keep private will get even more disseminated, right? I know that's not the full answer you're referring to platforms, but just plugging on that. 
Thank you, Mariana. Yeah, Angika. Yeah, I'll just pick up on the part of platforms. I think it's really important that we continue the work. Uh, I think there's a, a piece of work that stream that's going on right now under generation equality uh, on the technology action platform that is looking at um, platforms themselves actually including some of these features in the design uh, of the platforms and I think it's really important for us to connect what is the discussions here and monitoring what's happening in that uh, particular work stream because I can certainly relate to what you are saying. The case that I um, talked about when we were opening, we actually had great difficulty defending uh, the young women in court who were being sued for defamation of character by accused perpetrators because the particular platform that they used to out these perpetrators was, well, accused perpetrators, as I'm supposed to say, uh, was actually, uh, they, they closed the account and took down the posts. We had screenshots of that, but had we not had screenshots of that, we would have just kind of been having a real great challenge being able uh, to defend them. So I think that uh, based on some of what we've been watching, there is a role for platforms to play, but it also goes to the whole issue of not uh, overburdening victims of the violence with also defending themselves. You know, it, it is a form of secondary victimization where they now must uh, continuously tell their story at every point and prove uh, that uh, this actually happened. And fundamentally, I think it's really important for us to connect this to what's happening in societal discourse, right? It, it all stems from uh, a narrative of also not believing women. Uh, and therefore, the platforms have to take uh, play some role in that because they also perpetuate this notion that, you know, women could be lying about this and therefore, you know, they have to come to uh, the fold around issues of making sure evidence is available. Thank you so much, Onika. And thanks everyone for joining us here today. Not sure, Mahima, if you have anything to say, no? Um, you know, I can just add one thing, uh, just picking up on the last point. I think design is really important. There was a case in Australia, I was on a different platform, which made it very clear that if the perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, uh, unmatched, the victim was not able to access chats, and so was not able to go and report. And so, you know, when we, uh, I mean, at least from a Bumble perspective, when we saw this in the news, we realized there was a design uh, correction that needed to be made so that if someone has done something to you and then they block you or they unmatch you and you cannot find them to report them, you know, that that should be available. So, yes, I agree. I think, um, you know, platforms should make it easier to give people what they need to go get the, um, you know, get the justice they want. Thank you, Mahima. And thank you for joining us online. Thanks, everyone here today for joining us uh, on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, I guess that's a wrap. Thank you.